this uh, this this class is Pashas Tzav, and we're going to be talking about the uh, specifically. I've titled this "Holy Fire: Three Aspects of Avodah Hashem or Service to Hashem." And uh, we're going to examine something that seems slightly innocuous, and you don't really think about the aspects of it, but um, we're, we're going to discover that um, there's something to everything in the, in the Torah, right? Uh, right before class, Charlie had mentioned, well, why did they mention or talk about uh, all the sacrifices before they, before they went through the ritual purity process and what the priest had to wear? And obviously, I wish I had the answer. If I was smart, you would have the answer, but I'm not. But the whole point is, is everything, there's meaning behind everything, okay? So uh, that's why we'll never reach the depth of understanding the Torah. It's just going to always be there and very profound. Now, three flames were commanded to be kept on the altar. Uh, if you'll look at uh, information provided by the Temple Institute, uh, the altar on the temple that is going to be planned to be built, a third temple, is going to be big enough for an 18-wheeler to drive up on. And the cab and all be supported on the altar and the trailer on the ramp. Now that's big. That's a huge altar. So we're talking about essentially three very large fires are supposed to be maintained. And three arrays of fire to be made on top of the altar. And this is going to be each day. The first is a large, large fire in which the Talmud and other sacrifices, the Tamid, I'm sorry, and other sacrifices are burned which is, is going to be in the center. This is where all the, all, all the sacrifices are burned. The side smaller, off, uh, smaller fire is, is taking the coals into the pan to burn for the incense, incense each day. So one in the middle is for the, uh, for the offering, and there's another fire just for the incense, dedicated only for that. The third is nothing, uh, nothing on it, but it is to fulfill the commandment to be kept the fire perpetually. So this fire remains all the time. Now, we used to think there was just one big fire, and they just kept it going. Well, no, they actually had three different fires. Leviticus 6.6 6 says, A perpetual fire shall be kept burning on the altar. That would have been this smaller fire on the side, a starter fire. How many started a fire lately without any fuel? It's, it's not easy, okay? You have to really, you have to have the technique. You know, I'm talking about with a match or a lighter, but you still have to have the technique of making sure you have your kindling and all that stuff. And so this is why it was important to have a fire all the time on the altar. Now, which is curious to me, who was responsible for carrying the coals around when, when the temple was to, when the tabernacle was to be moved? Now, according to received tradition, it's derived from the scripture which follows uh, this phrase, where it is burned upon the altar, verse 2, which it says up here, the Lord spoke to Moshe, saying, Command Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering itself that is burned on the altar all night until morning, so that the fire on the altar can be ignited with it. It's referring to what indicates an array of fire. While the fire on the altar is kept going on it, uh, indicates the second array of for incense, and the fire on the altar shall be kept burning, indicates a third array. This is where the, the, um, uh, the middle sheen breaks out that there are three separate fires uh, up on this, uh, this altar. All in all, Maimonides cites three verses in this week's reading to derive the halakha concerning the three arrays of the fire on the altar. And these were to be done on a daily basis. I was going to take a try to sort of fathom the significance of the commandment, and let's see what we can learn from it today. The controversy amongst the Russianim, uh, the rabbis, uh, the rabbinical authorities regarding the purpose of sacrificial worship, and I think we kind of touched on it the other day, is, uh, is, is well known. Now, for the purpose of this class, we're not going to go into all the details, but for this class, I would like to just refresh some of the things that we talked about a couple of days ago. Because we said, what's the purpose? Was it to forgive sins? Well, we all know, no, it wasn't to forgive sins because there isn't an offering given for intentional sin. However, if one unintentionally committed an infraction, or they thought they did, they had the opportunity to bring an offering. Maimonides maintains that since it's customary throughout the world to build shrines and to have... Um, 
uh, sacrifices of animals and images uh, set up three uh, these temples since human beings sort of had a tendency to do sacrifices since the beginning of time. I mean, even Cain and Abel did sacrifices. There was this sort of built-in thing. This is uh, Maimonides' uh, idea is that they were used to it, and God had to give them a system to sort of accommodate their, their behavior. But Maimonides, Maimonides disagrees with him. A detailed discussion of their differences in opinion can be found in the writings of the Arbanal, and I can give you uh, the source of it later on. Now, let me explain to you the opinion of Rabbi uh, Maimonides on this issue, who said that the sacrifices had a second intent. Now, the first intent which was mentioned was what? That there were idols and people were used to doing sacrifices, even though they were pagans. That was a part of their lifestyle, and God had to somehow accommodate that. Well, Maimonides explains in, in the guide, he did not say that they were not motivated by the first incidents. This way of putting it indicates that there are two intentions regarding sacrifice. The first intention and the second intention. The first intention is to bring people closer to God, actually. The first intention is to bring people closer to God, sum, uh, submitting uh, to Him and, be and believing in His existence, His oneness, and His providence. It was the intention that Adam and Noah brought to their sacrifices. That's the person, the reason why Adam and the sons did a sacrifice. They wanted to draw a the, the, This rabbi does not deny the first intention exists in the commandments regarding sacrifice because of this, uh, because this actually was their first intention. That's the whole point, is to do a sacrifice to draw close to God. It is only the pagan idea that says that you do a sacrifice to appease a God. There's a big difference between the two. Sacrifices in Judaism has never been about appeasing uh, a bloodlust of a creator. Now, if the first intention is the reason that drawing close of sacrifice is agreed upon by all, it seems that the commandment to maintain three fires must have some significance. So that's what we're going to look at. These three aspects. To draw close to him, obviously, was the reason why we do the sacrifices, is to worship our Maker, to draw close to Him, to humble ourselves before Him, and to believe in His existence, His oneness, and providence. The first array of fire is a large array, which is sacrifices offer. So if you can picture this huge altar that would probably be as big as, the top of the altar would be as big as this room. Imagine that. Maybe even a little bit bigger. I don't know the exact dimensions. Do you have that, Tom? Uh, the right. So, right. But so the but the I I need to see if somebody can Google it real quick and just see what the third temple says on the dimensions of the top. But I think the top of the altar is probably about the size of this room. I'm, I'm thinking. So, that being the case, picture in the middle of the room a bonfire, big, huge fire of wood, hardwood that they would put the sacrifices on to burn. Now that fire had to be extremely high. Uh, I, I don't, you know, if, if you know anything about uh, burning of uh, flesh, it takes a lot of heat to effectively burn the flesh. And even with a hot fire, it burns all night. Because you and I both know that you could cook an animal like on a spit for hours and it not completely be consumed. So literally, if you had this animal thrown on the fire, it could take all night. And they would have to keep stoking the fire and adding wood to it to keep it burning. So it was a large deal. It is now, now some notes. Once the animal was put on the altar and the sacrifice was offered, it was, to not, it was not to be touched and nothing taken from it uh, for any other worship. Very important part. I want you to help me think for a second. What does putting the animal on the altar represent? What is the spiritual significance for us in the 21st century? Bringing our, yeah, bringing our base animal nature and saying that thing that constantly wants to fight against the goodness of Hashem, we want to submit it and we want to give ourselves to God. That's the whole point. So imagine, it's about giving yourself to God. I love this statement that says, the only problem about sacrificing yourself is you, all, you climb down the altar, you climb off the altar. altar. So that's, that's the problem, is it's, there's, we're not supposed to touch it. So what does that mean? That when we give of ourselves to Hashem, and we, we 
we become, uh, you know, in some aspects of our nature, we lay it down and say, you know what, Hashem, this is my, my animal nature. You created this way, me this way, but I'm going to walk according to my Yetzer Tov, my good nature. Yes, ma'am. I don't know if it's fits right now, but I have read um, previously that that's the reason why Isaac could never leave Israel, because once he had been offered and bound, he couldn't be, he could not leave. That's v absolutely correct, yeah. So the whole point is, is, that altar, is, that offering is put up there, it couldn't be used for anything else. Which gives us the idea of what we're supposed to do in our service to God. Once we submit ourselves in service to God, once we take this base nature of ourselves and we say, Hashem, it's yours. I am yours. You can't take it back. You can't take it and say, I, I'm now going to take what I've given to you and I'm going to serve some other entity or I'm going to serve some other purpose in my life. You will never be able to have that sacrifice on your own. It's to be permanently given to the Creator. This commandment is derived from the phrase that is found in verse 2. The burnt offering itself shall remain where it is. It is burned upon the altar. This burning point on the altar is self-contained is not transferable, serves no other purpose than burning the offerings. Meaning, this place, if you can imagine, you, you are the temple of the Creator. Okay? Imagine that. And if we are the temple of the Creator, there needs to be a centralized location in which you constantly are placing upon this part of your altar the need to bring your animal nature into subjection or into the control of the creator of the universe. And it's got to be the very center part. Notice this fire is where? It's in the center of the altar. So that means that in your service to Hashem, the first aspect, the most important aspect, is in the very center, the very prime directive of everything you do is to do what? Is to constantly bring your animal nature into, into a place in which it comes under the guidance of the creator of the universe. Right? Now, Rabbi Levi said, the etiquette of praise teaches whoever is self-praising ultimately is punished by, by none other than the fire. And I'm going to explain to you what this means. The Megid of Pelonioi explained this statement according to uh, Kali Yakar. Anyone who offers a sacrifice must take care to avoid two things in which Cain and Abel, the first to bring sacrifices, failed. Number one, not to bring an offering from someone, something which is inferior. That was Cain's offering. Number two, to bring one's own initiative and not wait until, you, uh, until motivated to imitate the actions of a fellow. What does that mean? I see you bring a lamb, so I'm going to say I'm going to one-up you, and I'm going to bring a bull. Now, even though maybe I couldn't afford it, but I'm only doing it because I want everybody to see how good my sacrifice is, this is forbidden. Do you understand? So the whole point is this. That central location in your life in which you bring yourself and you lay your animal nature and say, Hashem, it's yours, right, is only what you can bring. Others may be able to bring and have to bring much more effort to make that happen. And some other people, it's not a big effort, right, because it's just they, ha they have the ability to do it. It says that a person, this was, this was a, a, a great um, study I was, I was reading on why, why was this concept of eating blood so important in the text. And I found this fascinating because it was several different opinions as to why, you know, was it, was it like the, the, the pagans in which it was considered filthy or part of demonic thing and that's why they ate it, was to connect themselves to negativity and evil? Did God say don't eat it because it's evil? No. Uh, did God say don't eat it because uh, uh, simply because it's just blood? But He says you can't eat it because what's in it? Life. 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 Soul. Right. The fact. The soul. Right. The, the soul is in the blood. But it's interesting. You are rewarded for not eating something that naturally you don't want to eat anyway. Isn't that curious? I don't know very many people that want to eat blood. To be honest with you. Unless you're in some tribe in a country where they 
you know, they take blood and mix it with milk and drink it as some customary thing. Well, well, that's not that's not uh, eating blood. It just looks like it. They're not eating blood. No, honestly, they're not. Most people think the redness in a rare steak is blood. It's not. So, I had to get that straight. Huh? You didn't know that. Even if it's not a non-kosher, they don't, they're not properly drained? Well, I mean, mo most animals are going to be drained. Now, whether they were properly drained is the next question. Okay. But most are hung up by their heels and they drain, so. But anyway, the, say again. 18 by 18 by 15. That can't be it. That's, that's the Mishkan. Yeah. That's the altar of incense. Okay. Okay. That's for the Mishkan. Yeah. The, the the thing is, is there's a difference between the third and second and third temple, and the altar, because I'm thinking of the one that Ezekiel measured. But anyway, we'll we'll get into that later on. You understand? Because the one in the Mishkan was much smaller. You're you're correct. Okay, so uh, since he saw his, since Cain saw his brother do this, he too wished to make an offering. The only reason why Cain decided to do it is because Abel did it. And he wasn't motivated by some great notion to draw close to God. He's like, oh, my brother's doing it. I can't let my brother outdo me. So that's why he sort of half-heartedly brought the offering, right? He just brought the second best because the, the idea of the offering was not the prime directive. Now. So, the reason why he brought that is says that he could be proud and elevate himself. Otherwise, but for this fire, I'm continuing to quote on, on the altar, he is doomed to hell. What does it mean? Is that the altar in which he burns the, inst the, the sacrifice, if he does it out of the wrong reason and pride, and out of showing off, then that fire himself also burns it. It means, it's, it's a crazy concept. It doesn't mean literally he goes to hell. But it means that it's, it's as if he becomes the very sacrifice himself. It's a strange thing and we can get, get into it later on. So it says the Torah teaches us primarily a lesson in worshiping the Lord. We must worship according to our own abilities, not according to someone else's abilities, number one. We shouldn't copy our fellow. We should do what we can do. The aim of, uh, with the aim of self-aggrandizement, this idea that we're going to do it to make ourselves look good, this shouldn't be done. This is the first center of the fire. Whoever fails in doing this goes up in fire, is doomed to punishment. Now, that kind of makes common sense. That's not too big of a deal. We know that the very core of who we are should be to bring our animal nature and lay it upon the altar. But number two, uh, don't try to do it by any other, me any other body, any other person's measure. Some people do it in, in bigger ways or different ways than you do. But you are responsible for what you have to do. Second pur purpose of the fire was the fire for the incense. What is the incense, uh, 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 the fire used for the incense? And what does the incense represent? Prayer. Prayer, right? It's this constant source of fire, of inner worship, the inner sanctuary this took place in a place where it wasn't visible to the public except when it billowed out. But otherwise, it was in a private place. That means that we need to have reserved one of the three. There needs to be a fire that's maintained. That fire is maintained by our mitzvahs, right? Our study of Torah and mitzvahs. That fire is maintained for solely one thing, to give us fuel for prayer. If people say, well, I don't know what to pray about. I don't know what to say then it might be you don't have a fire to light the incense. The fire is the mitzvah that we do. It's the study of Torah. It's giving charity. When you begin to actively do, and this is what I love about Judaism, Judaism is not what you believe, it's what you do. And by your actions, you're giving opportunity. For example, if I'm giving charity, then there is a great opportunity to do hits by the dude about people's personal lives and how you can intervene to help them. If we're, if we're studying Torah, then there's this eagerness to want to connect to God in personal prayer. But all of that comes from maintaining a fire that's got to be ready and to be done each, each time the, uh, actually the menorah is cleaned, correct? Uh, it says, uh, this short 
uh, sort of fire must be burned by each person himself so that it can be used inside as being an offering incense there to the Lord from the inner recesses of the soul. Fortunately, I guess, the only person that really knows that you have this fire is you. I mean, you can fake it, I guess. But in reality, true connection to God ultimately comes down to be a very personal relationship with the Creator. Which is why we can't judge other people. We need to look at ourselves and ask, do I have this secret place that I maintain just to, and it's a secret place of maintenance of prayer to the Holy One, blessed be He. The third center of fire is entirely for the purpose of maintaining fires. This flame must always remain kindled at all times so that the other two fires can make sure that if they happen to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, snuffed out or get low, well, you can add to it from the other fire. Without any source of light or heat, a person should, um, should leave uh, within himself a spot where the fire is maintained. Now, what are we talking about? What, how would you think, how is fire maintained? This is pretty basic. Fuel. Fuel is wood, anything that's combustible, right? Oxygen, yeah, you need oxygen. Very basic thing. Hmm? Adding, adding combustion to it. Uh, but wood in of itself is not a fire. Oxygen of itself is what? Not a fire. So the spark is what I call and what we consider the divine essence of the creator that puts a flame to something that is combined. Right? Right. Now think about this. Wood and combustibles represent physicality. Oxygen represents spirituality or the, the mystical levels, the spiritual levels. But it's ultimately when these two things are combined together that God provides a divine spark and flame takes place. Now, I can have oxygen all day long, but if I don't have uh, a, a combustible, then even if a spark, a spark comes, we just get an ignition and an explosion and nothing else. Nothing maintains. But what's important is that we combine physicality. That's why it says that we serve Hashem with what? All of our heart, mind, and our soul. Every part of us, every part of us participates, both in the physical world and in the spiritual world. Now, I know that I had somebody mention to me the other day. I forgot who it was. Goodness gracious. They said um, that they're spiritually fasting. Right? Mm -hmm. I know. I, I don't even know what it means either, right? But this person's not from our, our world, right? He's spiritually fasting. So I said, what, what does that mean? Like you're giving up spiritual things, right? He goes, no, no. I mean, in my heart, I'm like, I'm setting aside things that I'm, I'm fasting as if I'm really fasting, but I'm doing it in a spiritual way. Now, in this guy's mind, he really thought he was doing something. In reality, he was doing nothing. Why? Because he wasn't combining physicality. You can't fast spiritually. You have to fast physically. Now, is there a spiritual component to fasting later on? Of course, because you, when we do it at the correct opponent, appointed times, something very mystical and spiritual takes place, right? But the point is, you got to have the, the physicality. Yes, ma'am. There's a difference between fasting because you are trying to draw close to Hashem, and you're fasting because you have to go have blood drawn to find out. Right. And I can see it every time that I, somebody is fasting because I got to pick my mom up to take her for a test. Right. And it's like, oh, I just can't wait to eat. <laughs> right. but if you're talking to somebody who's fasting for spiritual reasons right. and they combine the spiritual with it, right. then, you know, they're, they're okay. I draw my life. Oh, absolutely. But I w he wasn't talking about fa fasting for a spiritual purpose. He was talking, he's not giving up anything. He's just fasting spiritually. Fasting in his mind. <laughs> right, that, that's what I'm saying, right? It's a, it's a psychological... Uh, so in other words, he's make-believe fasting. He's, yeah, he's make-believe fasting, yes. Right, yeah. No, it's exactly it. And that's why I thought it was so funny because... Here is a guy that in his mind really was serious, like he was like, I'm fasting. 
I, I don't think it in other realms people that's how they think that's the difference no I know exactly so the whole point is is we know that that all sounds ludicrous and very comical but in reality we cannot serve Hashem without adding physicality to this whole thing and even even the, you think about the three the three fires that was a lot of work my son-in-law asked me uh, when I was visiting he came he said do you mind doing me a favor I said no not at all he said would you mind going out and 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 getting the fire started because he's getting ready to cook a bunch of fajitas and I said well certainly I'll do it so I go out I said do you have any fuel do you have any any charcoal anything and he goes no I just got a bunch of wood out there I'm like, oh boy we're gonna go back to caveman days right so I ripped a bag off a little piece off of a newspaper and I crumped it up in a pile and put a little fire on it and put one little stick at a time right right but one little stick at a time waved it with a board 40 minutes right and I'm adding and finally I got to the place where I'm adding the first logs because you can't add logs when it's little you put it out right and he comes out and he goes, why are you, why are you doing it there? I said, because it's the, it's the smoker. He goes, no, put it on the, in the fire pit. I'm like, you could have made it a little bit more easier for that, right? So I had to go out and start the whole process to get in the fire pit, right? Because it's not like you can just pick up the coals and go dump in the fire pit, right? So it's a process, it's work. And while I was doing that, I'm thinking, man, do you realize you have to have a guy that's got a lot of constitution to just maintain one fire on the altar that's work it's not like you can get it started at nine and check out and that you're finished for the day it's like you're constantly feeding them what happens when it's raining you know it's what happens when it's winds blowing high i mean it's, there's so many variables to the thing what happens when the wood may be wet the point is serving hashem is never without a lot of work okay has a lot of work and I'm gonna tell you what very few people I doubt went to the temple and said let me go find the Cohen that put sticks on the fire I want to thank him for keeping the fire very few people probably even thought about it it's like the mom that sweats over the stove all day and the kids not even thinking about it. they come in and they eat and they clear the house and mom's there washing dishes it can be sometimes the effort that no one sees why because those fires that you maintain are very personal internal they're very personal internal however i must say this where the where the world knows is the effect and the power of your closeness with the shim people will know people will know they will know when you have been korban close to the creator of the universe they'll see it in your life and it says that whenever that a person went to visit the temple that the odors from between the incense and between the burning of the wood and the sacrifice would leave with them and they would bring it back into their home it's just like when we barbecue at the house you smell the wood and the cooking on the on the clothes so may we all may we all in our effort to serve Hashem sort of uh, ooze of the great odor of our service to Hashem that concludes this year and we'll go on to our Q&A and whatever else. Yes? Um,